how easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. You can just lay there awake thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going, make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you've planned to accomplish for the day, it's amazing. You'll wake up before the alarm clock even tries to startle you away. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another and another and another. And pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy. How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn 10,000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. God and everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's 10,000 a year, wonderful. If it's 100,000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter 10,000 a year or a million a year. It doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can. Earn the most you possibly can. Be the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth to do the best you can. And here's what's interesting. Humans are the only life form that will do less than they possibly can. Humans are the only life form that will settle for less. Every other life form except human beings strive to its maximum capacity. How tall will a tree grow? Approximately as tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. Trees send their roots down as deep as possible, stretch their limbs up as high as possible, produce every leaf possible and every fruit possible. As a matter of fact, you never heard of a human physically growing half. We keep growing until we're done. Now that's a part of life we can't control. It's genetically coded. And that's probably why we keep growing till we're done. Because we can't control that part. It's the rest of our growing that we control. The growing of our minds, the expansion of our minds, that we can control. And that's what tends to get away from us. All life forms inherently strive to their max except human beings. Now, why wouldn't human beings strive to their maximum possibility? Here's why. Because we've been given the dignity of choice. It makes us different than alligators and trees and birds. The dignity of choice makes us different than all other life forms. And here's the choice. To become part of what we could be, enough to get by, or to become all that we can be. My best advice for you is to choose the all. Earn all you can. Make all the friends you can. Read as many books as you can. Develop as many skills as you can. See as much as possible. Do as much as possible. Make as much fortune as possible. Give as much of it away as possible. The max. There's no life like it. I'm telling you, once I got on track, I've never looked back. Pick up the challenge. Go for it. Take the best of the two easies. Take the route of it's easy to get ahead. It's easy to do all you can. It's easy to succeed. It's easy to have financial freedom. The more you do, the more you get.
So the two primary benefits of positive reinforcement are, number one, to build good habits, and number two, to create more energy to fuel your ambitions, your desires, your achievements. Now, one of the things that's important when, when you talk about balance is that there's a lot of people in our lives right now that they don't seem to appreciate when we're going for something big in life. It seems like they want to hold us back or, you know, don't go out there and, and go for it. You're going to fail and, and so forth. And as you're in this journey, you know, it can tend to zap some of your energy. Yes. You know, how do you deal with people who tend to like zap your, I call them energy vampires. You know, they kind of like zap all the energy from you if you allow them. Well, uh, how do you, you know the answer to that? And mm -hmm. the answer is, is keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> Don't spend time with people like that. Right. Uh, start to spend time with people who realize that most of the things you try will not work the first time. They will, you'll not succeed, at least not the way you expect it. In more than 90% of businesses, the business succeeds once it started in an area completely different from what the founders thought when they began. But the most important thing is that you launch and that, and that you keep moving and you keep learning and you keep getting experience and you'll constantly change direction as you get new information. What seemed like a great idea it won't work. So you have to be with people who recognize that this is the way the world works. People say, well, I tried it and it didn't work. Well, how many times did you try it? Well, I tried it once. No, you're going to try it 10 or 20 times. Wow. There was a, there was a great um, interview on the David Susskind show some years ago. They had uh, four self-made millionaires, all the age of 30, 30 or under. And they asked them during the first part of the show, how many different businesses have you been in before you found the one where you became a millionaire? And so at the commercial break, they sat down and calculated and came back after the break and the average was 17. They'd been in 17 businesses on average, some more, some less, before they found the right one. So the question I always ask is, did they fail 16 times and then only succeed on the 17th? And everybody suddenly realizes, well, no, they didn't fail, they learned, which made the 17th possible. People have to have that attitude. And the people around you have to have that attitude because because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. In my experience, if you're, if you're going to live a busy life, you're going to have constant failures, setbacks, disappointments, temporary defeats. They go with the territory. If you're not falling on your face a couple of times a day, it just means you're not trying hard enough. You're playing it too safe. So one of the things I learned as a young man, which had a profound effect on my life, was that the way to deal with a problem is to deal with it well before the problem happens by deciding how you're going to respond to it. And I say sometimes you can't take a first aid course at the scene of an accident. It's too late. You take the first aid course before the accident. And one of the things I've learned from Charlie and Jim and other people is the importance of making the decision in your own mind that you're never going to quit. I'm never going to quit. I have been asked what is the most important quality a person can develop, and I'm sure there's many answers to it. But one of the best answers is the quality of being unstoppable. Just say to yourself, I'm never going to quit. I'm going to have ups and downs and setbacks and disappointments. And as Charlie says, I'm going to think about quitting and talk about quitting and feel about quitting, but I'm not going to quit. And if you make that decision in advance, you've now closed that mental door. So then when you have a problem, you say, all right, what's the solution? Instead of doing what average mediocre people do is they seek who's to blame and they lash out at the world and they feel sorry for themselves, and just instead, instead focus on the solution. What's the solution? Well, you know, I've, I've read the books, you know, I've listened to the tapes, uh, I've been to all the events and, you know, it's like I've listened to so many tapes that sometimes I get sick and tired of hearing this particular tape because I've heard it so many times and it just seems like nothing's happening for me. Sometimes I just feel like crying, I'm still stagnant. These people who complain about life not changing are really not doing anything because it's impossible. It's like, it's like eating really healthy food and saying, I don't feel any different. And I've eaten all this healthy food and I don't feel any different. Here's an interesting point. It was pointed out to me by one of my friends in Germany. He said, learning goes by plateaus. He said, first of all, we take things from, we have a big jump up and we come back down and then we plateau. And then we have a big jump up and we come back down and then we plateau. But each plateau is higher than the previous plateau. It's on the plateaus that people lose heart and quit. 
is but the plateau is a normal part of learning is you have the high the inspiration the goals and you set them down and so on and then you plateau and on the plateau you don't see any change for a while so you have to have confidence that you are moving toward that next explosion mm -hmm. that will come up again and then you will come down again and plateau again mm -hmm. you just have to have faith that this is taking place like seeds are germinating under the soil at a certain point they will burst into bloom learn to write i'm i'm dead serious like i'm dead serious about that um because writing is formalized thinking and so the way you write is first of all you need a problem because why write if you don't have a problem so this is good advice if you're just writing an essay, by the way, for your classes. It's like, pick a bloody problem that you want to write about, because otherwise it's false right from the start. It's up to you to engage with the material until you find something that grips you, that you desire to investigate. Okay, so you need a problem. Well, the next thing you need to do is, well, you need to have something to say about the problem. Well, so, reading. Reading is really good for that. Read as much as you can, get your, your hands on, that addresses the problem. Okay, so now, now, you, now you know a bunch of things, or at least provisionally know them. You at least have access to them. Well, now you start, you start sorting through it. It's like, okay, well, maybe I need to summarize what I've learned. And then I need to iron out the contradictions between what I've learned. And I need to elegantly formulate that. And, and I need to get my word choice right, and my phrase choice right, and my sentence choice right, and I need to organize the sentences into proper paragraphs, and the paragraphs into proper sequence so that I have a coherent argument. And at the same time, what you're doing is, is you're, 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 um, you're integrating your own personality at the highest and most abstract level of organization, and you're sharpening your tools, and you're putting yourself straight because you're learning to think. You learn to do that by writing. And so I would say, pick some hard problems and learn to write very, very carefully. And, I, and when I say pay attention to the word, I mean that. Pick the right words. Organize them into the right phrases. Get your sentences straight. Like when I wrote my first book, Maps of Meaning, I believe I wrote every sentence in that book 50 times. 50 variants of every sentence. I read it once. I'd write it again, I'd write it again, I'd write it again, and I'd have a little competition. Which sentence is better? Which sentence is better? And pick that sentence. Do the same with the paragraphs. Over many, many years, you hone your words. They're, they're the most powerful thing about you, bar none. If you are an effective writer and speaker and communicator, you, you have all the authority and competence that there is. And so you're at university. Maybe you're taking a humanities degree. Well, that, what's the humanities degree for? It's to teach you how to think. You learn to think by writing. Now, there's more to read, to speak, and all of that. But the best thing you can do is read and write every day, a couple of hours every day. Write about things you find important and see if you can, see if you can discover what you believe to be true. And that'll build you a foundation. And it's unbelievably practical. Like if you look at people who are phenomenally successful across life, there's various reasons, but one of them is, is that they're unbelievably good at articulating what, they, what they're aiming at and strategizing and negotiating and, 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 and enticing people with a vision forward. It's like, get your words together, man. That's, that makes you unstoppable. And that, that's really, that's the core of the humanities, that idea. Get your words together. Make yourself an articulate creature, and then you're, you're deadly in the best possible way.